right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And then I'll mute mine as well. Hello and welcome to the global seminar of the global Colum our second global seminar of the Global Columbia Collaboratory. Thank you for joining us today as we present the second of three seminars in a global series focused on pathways to decarbonization. We've invited experts to step into the collaboratory to discuss critical issues related to land use, renewable energies and biofuels, and both the positive and challenging effects of working toward net zero carbon emissions. Before we begin this important discussion, and especially for those of you joining us for the first time today, I want to provide a bit of background about the Global Columbia Collaboratory. Columbia, Columbia University's Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement in partnership with the Columbia Global Centers and Columbia World Projects launched the Global Columbia Collaboratory in May 2020 as a virtual exchange initiative to support undergraduate students around the world. The Collaboratory brings students, thought leaders, educators together and promotes cross-cultural communication and enhances skills and global competence to allow students to reflect, ideate, and collaborate to empower them to make a difference in the world. Students have participated from over 40 countries and are drawn from all three undergraduate, undergraduate schools at Columbia, as well as institutions around the world. This fall, we have 30 students from 16 countries representing 12 different universities. They're tuning in this morning from across Asia, Europe, the Americas, including New York, Islamabad, Rabat, Tel Aviv, Rio de Janeiro, just to name a few. Our students have submitted questions for our panelists, and I encourage our global audience to submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. The chat will not be enabled, so please put your questions in the Q&A button. Again, I want to welcome everyone to this Global Columbia Collaboratory Seminar, and I want to thank all of our partners and our esteemed panelists. We're so pleased to be working directly with the Columbia Global Center in Rio and the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Without further ado, I want to introduce Eduardo Zogby, our moderator for today. Thanks, Eduardo. Thank you very much, Gail. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us today. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Eduarda Zogby. I'm uh, the director of the Women in Energy program in Brazil at the Columbia Global Center Rio. And it is my honor today to introduce you to our guest speakers. I'll start first with Eloisa Borges. She's the director of oil and gas and biofuels at uh, EPE, the, the energy uh, company energy research company from the Ministry of Mines and Energy in Brazil. She has a PhD in economics from the Federal University of Rio, a master in economics from the Federal University of Rio, and was a postgraduate in public law from the State University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Eloisa was a visiting researcher at the University of Virginia Law School, a fellow at the Columbia Women's Leadership Program at Columbia University, and authored scientific articles and book chapters related to energy savings, regulation of energy industries, and defense of competition. Now, Jeanette Wicks-Lim is a research professor at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, where she also earned her PhD in economics. Um, she also specializes in labor economics with an emphasis on the low wage labor market, the political economy of racism, the intersection of income, employment, health and healthcare, and the employment related impacts of clean energy policies. She frequently serves as an economic policy consultant for non governmental organizations, as well as state and municipal legislative committees in her area of research expertise. Welcome to our speakers, and I'll pass over the stage to Eloisa Borges. Hi, good morning. Uh, for those who are in East, uh, New York time and Brazil time, I'm very glad to be here today. Um, I'll start uh, with my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. It's okay. still in your um it's I, I did it again, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I, we That's tried right. that, but after three years, you know, <laughs> I still, I still, I still make this mistake. Uh, is it working now? It still shows your main screen. I think mm. if you put it in pre uh, present presentation mode before you share screen, did you try that? Let's try. Did it work? Yes, there yeah. we go. Okay. I don't know what I did wrong the first time, but if you can, if it's working, great. So a uh, quick explanation, the Energy Research Company of Brazil, uh, it's a public owned company. Uh, our main goal is to do, well, energy research, policy design on all areas of energy. So uh, oil, gas, biofuels, electricity, uh, clean energy in general, energy efficiency, uh, energy economics. So we cover, and our main, uh, 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 our main job is to support the energy planning in Brazil, but public policy related to energy in general. Uh, and that's why uh, we've been uh, working a lot in like a, a, a very uh, uh, comprehensive way to try to understand uh, where the energy transition is leading us and how we get there. So uh, if you're here and you've already had a, a, a webinar on uh, land use and decarbonization, well, we are going through a transition to low carbon economies. And uh, in the context where we have a uh, climate change and environmental policies, uh, uh, trying to address it. And I think each year uh, from the past 10 years, we can give specific ex examples of floods, fires, uh, uh, draws. Uh, and we've been looking for new energy sources. Uh, but uh, again, this presentation, first time I did, I, I did this slide it was 2020 and we already had uncertainty in fuel prices and geopolitical threats and they have not uh, uh, got any better. The main goals of this particular transition is reduction of local and global emissions and a search for energy security. The only thing we can be certain is that the energy use will change, it must change, but the way we uh, supply energy must change too. The thing is, if we look on our past, on global past energy transitions, not the first time uh, we've done that, <clears throat> but previously, all the energy transitions were moved uh, by economic goals, efficiency goals. So uh, industries and the way the world use energies, it moved from wood to coal, from coal to oil. Uh, now we are moving from oil, from hydrocarbons, from fossil fuels in general, towards cleaner energies. And the, the difference is that this time, the main driver is not uh, purely economic. Uh, since it's not purely economic, uh, it is driven by <clears throat> uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, but by the perception that the climate has changed. It's not in the wrong, uh, 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 it's not the wrong word. The climate has a red change. We are trying to stop it from changing further. Uh, that energy transition will require a, a faster pace of technological innovation than the one we have been experienced. It will uh, include digitalization, efficient use of our energy resources, because we need energy and we need each time more en energy. But uh, uh, we cannot, if we keep at this pace, you know, uh, it's not sustainable. Uh, also, we are shifting to low carbon sources and electrification. But the thing is, energy transition is also not just about electrification electrifying everything will not get us there. Uh, 
uh, uh, we don't have the technology. We don't even have the, 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 it's not even, you know, physically possible. The amount of uh, uh, energy that we use, we need to try and find other solutions. And that includes, besides electrification, low carbon fuels, CCS, reducing our environmental footprint, uh, synthetic fuels, everything we can get. That it's a challenge, but it provides also an opportunity. Since we can, we have different ways to put that puzzle together. Uh, each country can look at its own resources and its own possibilities and try to, you know, it's kind of a, a open Lego box. Instead of buying, you know, a, a fixed Lego where you can, you have a specific goal, you buy one of those giant with multiple pieces where you can just try to create your own uh, uh, final strategy. Uh, I'm not just saying that. Uh, there are several studies that show that clean electricity and elect electrification will not be enough. Also, uh, we rely heavily on technology that are still under development. So you can pick and choose any scenario you want. We have a scenario, ARENA has a scenario, International Energy Agency has a scenario, the United States government, another one. Uh, but in each and every one of them, there are some common uh, 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 aspects. Uh, we need electrification, but we also need to develop advanced biofuels, low carbon hydrogen, carbon capture strategies. Uh, we might need to advance on nuclear, digitalization, uh, energy efficiency, because the decarbonized future is not yet a future without hydrocarbons. Uh, again, this is a, a, a graph from the energy, uh, International Energy Agency that says uh, uh, for the net zero sustainable development, we would need to enhance renewables a lot, but in the end of the, the, the day, we would still need a little bit of hydrocarbons to complete the balance. Uh, the th problem is with our current policies, we are not getting there. And we had COP26 and then now COP27. Uh, energy ministries are just, you know, in a previous, just this week, trying to address the main important goals to see if we can change from this to that. But there is no doubt that the transition is inexorable. We must move faster, although we are not accomplishing that. But developing countries still need energy access. Uh, we still have around 800 million people without extra access to clean energy, uh, without access to energy, not even clean energy, but they don't have access to energy. And developing countries still uh, uh, will need energy to meet its economic and population growth. So keep that in mind. The total amount of energy we still need uh, uh, to find a way to provide that energy, to provide that uh, uh, development, uh, uh, sustainable development, uh, without hindering anyone's strategy. Uh, bottom line, the oil sector plays a leading role. And uh, especially in Brazil, we think it will help us since it's relevant in the long term and it's in their best interest to diversify and migrate expertise, it might help us to solve the puzzle that this webinar puts together uh, or proposes. So how do we ensure and just transition without job losses? We build on, on what we have and try to mar migrate expertise. Uh, in the net zero scenarios uh, from the energy, uh, International Energy Agency, uh, they estimate that the, the new energy sources will cre create around 14 million new jobs uh, in energy supply by 2030. The thing is, when we move from one energy sources to another, 
fossil fuel production could lose around 5 million positions. It's a net gain of 9 million. Good, right? But what do we do about those ones who actually lost their jobs? Uh, when we talk about uh, fair energy, a fair transition, uh, we are worried about those 5 million people around the, the, the world. Uh, and that requires local policies. It requires us to uh, uh, zoom in uh, the capabilities of each country and the uh, um, constraints of each industry. Uh, if, we, if we look at this, this uh, if we open this graph uh, by sector, we see that EVs is a lot of these uh, uh, additional workers. We count a lot in efficiency, especially uh, building and innovation, innovative technologies, technologies that we might not have yet. Uh, so we need to repurpose or retrain quite, uh, quite an expressive number of people in uh, capabilities that they might not have. Uh, another difficulty is that this, those new jobs not always are in the same places or sectors where employment's lost. For instance, in Brazil, uh, most oil and gas uh, employment in this, is in the southeast and part of the northeast part of Brazil. But when we look at renewables, for instance, the renewable uh, potential is in another part of Brazil. So it's not even the same geographical location. It happens in Brazil, it happens in the US, it happens in, in, in Asia, Europe, Africa, everywhere. And uh, they will be most pronounced in communities that are heavily dependent on this fossil, fossil energy production. And that might create a public policy problem because they will, uh, uh, um, they will try to, 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 uh, to prevent that. So we will have a, 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 a political problem. We might have a political problem that we must be aware and try to address before it prevents the transition. And even where the exact number is small, the impact can be significant because of you know the the all the the government take the energy fossil fuel industry generates so there is a need for long term planning so that those dislocated workers can find work in related sectors so that those communities and governments can you know uh, 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 try to migrate their economies their economies uh, and therefore, we minimize the near-term effects, and then we minimize the 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 I forgot the word uh, uh, the, the the barriers or 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 the counter forces towards our main goal. Uh, in Brazil, what the way we see there, the policy designs based on expertise migration from the oil and gas industries to new technologies might help. And since I saw that you already have uh, uh, quite a, a lot of material on specific case of the United States and San Diego, California, and how to, uh, uh, it's a, uh, that's how we do it, right? You look in the local communities and you, you know, try to, uh, um, address and see which, which are the capabilities, who is actually losing their jobs and how do we address that. So I brought two other examples. In the middle of the uh, 2000 years, the Brazilian government launched a program, it's called PROMIMP, but back there, it was to prepare the workforce, anticipating the events of the oil and gas industry in Brazil. It was not public money, it was a public oriented investment, because it was mainly um, uh, money from R&D uh, obligations that the companies had, and part of it was dislocated uh, for this program. It was on technical level, uh, high school, 
high schools, uh, technical uh, schools, universities, and it went up to postgraduate uh, to graduate uh, programs. So it was very comprehensive. And by the end of the 2000s, like 20, I think the last year they had this program was uh, 2010 or 20, or 20, 2010 or 2011. Uh, and the main idea was that they assessed the workforce in Brazil and they said, okay, now we, we've done it. We've, we were able to prepare the workforce and now, you know, it will work uh, smoothly. We still have the training programs, but you, you don't need a mandate for it anymore. Another example, uh, not from Brazil, but we see, for instance, in, in Spain, in Galicia, in some uh, areas uh, uh, of Spain, municipalities have specific requalification programs. Those ones are public money. So uh, the municipalities invest their money in requalification for, you name it, or engineers, engineering, uh, 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 business, uh, economics, accounting. So they take, for instance, uh, an engineer, engineer that was graduated like 20 years ago and don't do not have the the the, the capabilities for all the technological programs that they use now you know he, he, he learned way back so he cannot find a job currently and they requalify they retrain that person and uh, uh, in order to empower uh, the, 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 uh, the person to find another job. It's hard. Another example, very specific, for instance, if you're, if you're trying to address uh, gender uh, gaps or uh, minority gaps, is you try, you go back into training programs specific for those communities. For, for instance, Eduarda uh, has a, uh, she already said, she's director for the Women in Energy program. Uh, it's very common that you say, for instance, here in Brazil, transmission lines, uh, electricity transmission lines. The problem is that you don't have enough female electricity engineers. And you don't have enough female electricity engineers because they don't want to go to that particular uh, area. So you go back to high school and you try to understand uh, 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 why you don't, why we don't have enough uh, women in STEM. And then you, you, you have to keep going back uh, to address that particular issue. So it's, it's, it's very tricky because it requires, again, to identify and understand the specifics of each country, each municipality. Well, uh, as a final remark, I think, I don't know if I'm running out of time. Uh, we do know that energy systems will follow a carbon intensity reduction and the economy will follow a carbon intensity reduction. And the climate agenda will influence international trade, international relations and uh, uh, local uh, policies. The global energy mix will be the most diverse that we have ever seen. But there is still a technological race. We still see several routes, several alternatives that will get us there. Uh, and it's not clear which one will assume a relevant role in energy transition. But there are common patterns, right? So biofuels will probably have a, 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 a role to play. Electromobility will probably have a, a role to play. So those patterns that we identify in every scenario, we can already address a fair transition for those industries. Uh, we have 17 sustainable development goals. Clean energy is one of them, but they are interconnected. So we must keep that in mind. We must keep, keep in mind that we cannot uh, 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 focus, when you think of, about a fair transition, we cannot focus only in clean energy. Uh, we must look at job losses. We must look at gender balance. We must look. We must look at uh, 
access. So all, all of them combine. In Brazil, our strategy is based on bioenergy, renewables, energy efficiency, and low carbon hydrogen, but nuclear and natural gas play key roles and they will keep playing key, key roles in the Brazilian strategy for a while. Uh, oil and gas is part of the equation, but then uh, uh, it has to reduce its carbon footprint. So uh, it's important when we look at the, the, the job part of the equation uh, to address technical capabilities in CCUS, uh, low carbon fuels, and uh, each country uh, and each uh, 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 government needs to identify policies to benefit from its competitive advantages and create new advantages. Uh, those are the, the, well, the thoughts I would like to share, and thank you very much. Eloisa, hey, thank you so much for your presentation, and I'm very grateful that you mentioned the gender gap. Uh, definitely, when I think when we're talking about the transition and job losses, I think that uh, women are not even part of the of the energy uh, industry as much as we wanted what we want them to. So, if we're thinking of new jobs, we also have to create incentives for women. Thank you so much. Um, now, I'm going to uh, move over to Jeanette's presentation. Um, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Okay, let me get my slides up. Okay. Um, looks okay to everybody? The slides are up? Yes, okay. perfect. Okay. Okay, so um, in my presentation today, today uh, what I'll be doing is summarizing key lessons that I've learned from studying the labor market impacts, labor market impacts specifically, that we can expect when economies transition um, to clean energy economies. And I, I it, this is a nice, I think, link to um, the first presentation because uh, in these studies, what we, we tried to do, my colleagues at Perry and I, um, is to look at each state economy um, we looked at at least eight different state economies and see you know, what is a roadmap that we could develop within each of these state economies to transition um, them to a clean energy economy. Um, we also, uh, I think somebody mentioned, may have mentioned earlier that we did a study in San Diego, so something more localized, but also um, we also did a national study. And recently we did a study on um, South Korea. Um, so, you know, what, what we try to do in each of these um, studies is, well, let me uh, focus on what I'm going to be talking about, which is the labor market impact. Um, because as a labor economist, what I tried to do is to examine what are the actual employment impacts um, from transitioning in terms of both the quantity of jobs that would be uh, gained and lost, and also the quality of jobs that would be gained and lost, and also who has access to these jobs. Um, so across all these different studies that we have uh, done, there are some clear patterns. Um, so those, are, those patterns are what I want to talk about because these come up over and over again. Um, so just to give some background, some more background on the studies and what they're trying to achieve, is really to develop guidelines for what's necessary, um, what are the necessary clean energy investments to hit specific emission reduction targets. And so we use as our guideline, the Intergovernmental pa Panel on Climate Change uh, <clears throat> recommendations, which is to reduce carbon emissions um, by 45% by 2030, and then to get to net zero by 2050. So that's kind of our goal, we look at each each state economy um, in our state level reports and try to see what, what is a uh, roadmap to get to those emission reductions. But important, we also um, have as our objective is to maintain a healthy economic environment. That is, we want to maintain a, um, a sort of normal level of economic growth while achieving these reductions in emissions. So the specific elements of the studies, each of these studies is, you know, uh, basically to assess the existing energy landscape, to figure out what are the reductions in fossil fuel energy consumption that are necessary to hit the emissions reduction targets, 
to determine the types and levels of clean energy investments needed to meet energy the energy needs that exist, you know, while assuming a healthy level of economic growth. Um, and then to examine the employment impact from investing in clean energy and divesting from fossil fuels, and really to look at, again, the quantity and quality of the jobs that are gained and lost but also to raise the potential issues related to justly distributing the new job opportunities and transitioning um, displaced fossil fuel workers. And so uh, what I wanna emphasize is that these studies try to really get our arms around the magnitude of the project uh, that each state needs to engage in and to also sort of put up red flags when issues come up in terms of what are policymakers gonna to need to be very mindful of as, uh, as um, states transition to a clean energy economy. So again, across this, these studies, there are some common themes that uh, just keep arising, not just across the state studies within the US, but also you know, these themes seem to also appear in the, uh, the international study. We did the study on South Korea. Um, we're also taking a look at Greece, um, but and also looking when we looked at a local economy like San Diego, California, these things emerge over and over again. So these, I'm just going to jump to what those three um, themes are that I want to talk about today, and then I'll go into detail about each of them. So um, this is probably no surprise to anybody, but uh, you know, transitioning to a clean energy economy will significantly expand employment opportunities, and that really is just a reflection of the fact that we need to invest. Uh, significant amounts of resources towards shifting towards renewable energy sources and also to really improve the energy efficiency of our economies. So that's the first key takeaway. But the, the, the goal of these reports, again, is to get our arms around what is the magnitude of these, um, of these numbers, you know, how much do we need to invest and what kinds of jobs numbers are we talking about? The second key takeaway is that uh, um, there are some key issues uh, related to the kinds of job opportunities that are going to arise um, from these investments. And this goes back to the discussion earlier of how there is a distinct um, and very consistent gender gap in the kinds of job opportunities that um, the kinds of access that are likely is that likely going to exist for the job opportunities that are created by clean energy investments. And there are also issues of job quality when compares, comparing the types of jobs that are lost in the fossil fuel sector compared to what will be generated by clean energy investments. And then lastly, I wanna also put some numbers to the transition away from fossil fuels in terms of job loss um, to see you know, what kinds of, you know, what are the numbers of jobs that we can expect to lose and how can you manage that? And really to, the key point is that a well-managed transition can really result in minimal job displacement. So those are the three takeaways. And then now let's sort of step back and fill in the details behind these three takeaways. So the three different um, states I wanna talk about throughout my presentation are three states uh, that we studied um, various years in the last few years. Um, but I chose these three because they represent very different energy landscapes, and um, they, with, you know, for that reason, they have to choose different levels of investment and then have different types of employment um, outcomes. But again, there are themes that will uh, will um, come across all three. Um, so the three states I want to highlight are California, Colorado, and West Virginia. All have similar. We try to adopt similar. We do adopt similar emissions goals reduction goals in each of the reports in terms of the framework we try to present. Um, and uh, you know, their, pri their primary uh, energy sources in, within fossil fuels are as one would expect, but their the composition is somewhat different. In California, uh, oil and natural gas predominate. In Colorado, oil and natural gas play large roles, but coal also uh, figures significantly. Um, in West Virginia, coal is very significant in the state's economy um, and oil, natural gas um, are important, but coal really uh, is uh, the predominant fossil fuel energy source in West Virginia. So we're sort of reflecting um, 
those energy sources as well as the level of energy efficiency within each state and, the, and therefore the intensity of the um, en of energy use within each state. You can see that these states vary a lot in terms of their carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions per capita. So the metric we use to um, grade each state in terms of how well they're doing in reducing their carbon emissions. So California, um, relative to the US average of 17.2 metric tons per capita, California performs pretty well at 9.8. Colorado is middling at about the average, 16.2 metric tons per capita. And then West Virginia um, is one of the worst states across the country. Um, at 50.7. Again, you know, reflecting the composition of the energy sources that, that the state relies on, as well as a low level of energy efficiency across the state that contributes to that high level of carbon emissions uh, per capita. Okay, and so then just to give you an idea of what kinds of investments would be necessary um, to get the state economies, um, I should preface this by saying that I'm going to be focused on the first stage from uh, 2021 to 2030, this 10-year phase of trying to get to 40% uh, reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so this table represents the big round numbers of the levels of investment that would be required to transition away from fossil fuels and to expand clean renewable energy sources and also um, it, uh, improve energy efficiency in order to meet the energy needs of each of these states while maintaining a healthy level of economic growth. So you can see across the top of this table, the levels of energy efficiency investments um, for California. I'm just gonna focus on California, but you can see also the numbers for West Virginia. Um, annual investment investments over this nine year period is about $9 billion is what we estimate. And that produces 70,000 jobs annually. And those jobs, I just want to also um, be clear that those jobs include the what we call direct jobs, jobs that are closely associated with the clean energy investments, such as um, uh, installing solar panels, um, building um, wind turbines, uh, installing wind turbines, um, those are the direct jobs, and those are about half of that employment number, a little bit more than half. Then there are also indirect jobs, which are those jobs associated with supplying all the materials, um, services necessary to, uh, to support those direct jobs. And then finally, there's also what we call induced jobs. Those are the jobs that are um, created because the workers um, that are earning the salaries from the direct jobs and the indirect jobs have more money to spend and support more jobs within the economy, it's this macroeconomic effect of having greater levels of income uh, of earnings through these new jobs. So that's what's included in that 70,000 annual employment figure from the energy efficiency investment of $9 billion per year in California. The next set of rows shows you the level of clean energy, clean, clean renewable energy investments, about $66 billion, um, producing about 350,000 jobs annually. So they see that there's a, a larger spending in the clean renewable energy sources. And those are primarily investments in developing capacity in solar, wind, but also geothermal and others. I should go back and say, in terms of the energy sufficiency uh, investments, those are targeted primarily um, in retrofitting buildings, making them more energy efficient and insulating better, uh, those kinds of activities, but also making industrial processes more efficient um, and expanding public transit and improving the electric grid. So those are some of the kinds of investments that the energy investment, the energy efficiency investment program is involved in. Um, so in total, you know, again, looking at California, the first column in the bottom two rows gives you the, the total clean energy investment that we um, map out in order to get California to a 40% emissions reduction by 2030. It's about $76 billion, which is equal to 2.1% of the state's GDP, as the level of economic activity within the state. So I like to always put that number in context because, of course, $76 billion is not a number that I think that anybody can really wrap their minds around. But in terms of what that means relative to the state economy, you can see that it's 2.1%, which is significant, but is not an overwhelming percentage of the 
act economic activity within the state. And then the employment that would be produced, again, this includes the direct, indirect, and induced jobs, is about 420,000 jobs annually, and that's equal to about 2% of the labor force in California. Again, this is a meaningful number. This is 2% is, is uh, uh, a substantial number of new jobs that would be supported by these investments. Um, so similarly, what you'll see though, um, as again, a theme across these state programs is that uh, the level of investment is substantial, but not overwhelming. So between two and 4% of state GDP, see Colorado, it's about 4% and about West Virginia is about 4%. And the level of employment that would be added to the economies from these investments range between about two and 4%. So substantial numbers um, of jobs associated with these investments. Jeanette, sorry, but I think we were, we need to wrap up now to open for oh, the Q and A. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, Maybe uh, your last remarks. Yes, I, I'm going to try to go through a, a few more details and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll make two of my major points, which is to think about the kinds of jobs that are being created. Um, and these, again, are gonna be, these are similar things across the uh, states is, um, you know, I can start with this table, which shows you the educational credential, credentials that are typically expected by the jobs that would be created by the clean energy investments. Um, and you see that there's a range of uh, educational credentials that are usually held by workers that have these kinds of jobs. Um, and because of the level of uh, spending and jobs created, particularly in the construction industry, you see that there's a substantial share of those jobs that um, are have, that require a high school degree or less. Um, the other point is that, you know, within the US context, the union density of these jobs, these it's is about average. So, you know, not great, not terrible, but about average. You can see, um, this is a point raised before, is that the gender composition of these jobs is um, quite, uh, women are very underrepresented in these jobs. Um, and the racial composition in the case of California, Colorado, and West Virginia, for the clean energy jobs, these numbers actually reflect what's available in the uh, local labor force. But if you do a breakout of types of jobs within each of these sectors, you can see that the, the top paying jobs, like the managerial positions, tend to be held by white workers. And so that's an, an issue of concern. Average compensation, compensation, these kind of range around what is sort of average to above average income uh, earnings for these jobs relative to what's available in the state. So with the clean energy jobs, these are average um, or in some above average. Um, just to try to move along really quickly, uh, I wanted to really hammer home this point about the fossil fuel job losses because this is something that's uh, uh, frequently raised as a, a, a problem with the transition. And one of the things we try to do really carefully in these studies is we look at the fossil fuel related employment, then what would be required to wind those sectors down in a carefully managed way, so over gradually over 10 years, take into account the number of workers that would be retiring over time, over that 10 year period. And if this can be sort of evenly a gradually done, if this can be a well-managed transition out of fossil fuels, the actual number of job displacements, that is workers who lose their jobs and new jobs, um, actually is quite small. It's, you know, this bottom row in this slide, you'll see somewhere in, in the order of 0 0.02% uh, of the labor force for California, same for Colorado and 0.2% for West Virginia where um, fossil fuels plays a, a larger role. These are a fraction of the clean energy jobs that would be produced if we were transitioning into a clean energy economy. Uh, about you know, one, two percent in California, Colorado, and about uh, nine percent in West Virginia. A fraction of the jobs that would be produced by transitioning out of fossil fuels into clean energy, clean um, energy sources. Um, so the other thing I want to highlight, though, is in this transition of looking at fossil fuel jobs and trans transition out of those, you'll see that. A couple of things I want to really highlight that are things that policymakers are going to have to be very aware of. Again, these jobs that have been lost, you know, it has a similar gender composition. You see a very low level of women being represented in these jobs. 
But you also see that these are very high paying jobs. All of the, the average compensation of these jobs, uh, we're just down there, is above the average compensation of the jobs that have been produced. So that's this, there is a job quality issue that's going to be um, important for um, policymakers to think about. And then finally, as in each of our reports, um, we try to think carefully about what are the kinds of supports to these fossil fuel workers transitioning, you know, what kinds of supports they need to transition out of the jobs that they have and into what's newly available with the clean energy investments. And so there are a series of elements that we think are important. Job guarantees, because there, there are jobs that are being uh, created that these jobs could be, um, these workers could be transitioned into. Wage insurance to deal with this gap between the quality of jobs in the fossil fuel sectors versus the clean energy sectors. Um, of course, job training, wage replacement while training and relocation support. And if you look at the costs of these kinds of programs, we're talking about you know, one to 4% of the overall clean energy program, which within each of the states. So I'll just, I'm, I'm not gonna go over the key takeaways again, but just to say that there's a significant level of investment that's required that will produce significant new employment opportunities. There's are gonna be clear issues of the women being underrepresented in clean energy sectors. So that's gonna be something that policymakers are gonna to have to be very intentional about. And that uh, black, indigenous, and other workers of color tend to be underrepresented under in the better paying positions within clean energy sectors. And so that is something that policymakers are gonna to have to be mindful of. And that the average compensation of clean energy jobs tend to be lower than what we see in the fossil fuel sector jobs. Again, something that policymakers will have to um, be mindful of. And finally, again, just to hammer home this point, that the job, number of jobs that would be lost in the fossil fuel sectors is very small relative to the potential jobs created by the investments we would need to transition to clean energy economies. And that's it. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much, Annette. This was um, this was great. Um, maybe I'll just quickly, uh, to benefit from for our Q and A time, uh, just pass over to Gail so she can introduce uh, one student to make a question. Great, thank you, Eduarda, and thank you both to Jeanette and Heloisa. So interesting and so timely. I think a lot of people, our students in addition, are these are really important questions. Um, so now I want to introduce one of our collaboratory students, Rachel Brzezicki is a sophomore at Columbia College studying sustainable development. And she joined the collaboratory because she's excited about discussing and contributing her ideas to topics such as economic transition and culture change. And in addition to Rachel's studies and participation in the collaboratory, she interns for the Ridger, excuse me, the River Project Maganja. It's a global resource hub for river restoration projects where she's learning about the complexities and stakeholder relationships involved with the or excuse me, re restoration projects that organizations are working on. She is also an active member of the Sustainable Development Goals Students Hub and Consilience, the Journal of Sustainable Development here at Columbia University. Through these roles, Rachel contributes to furthering the SDGs on our campus and throughout New York City. So Rachel, take it away with your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my question is more uh, for like any panelists. Um, so the issue of job loss as the fossil fuel industry loosens its grip on the economy is like one of the most popular counter arguments I hear from middle and low income people um, when discussing addressing climate change. Um, are there any sorts of programs already in place or pilot programs being tested um, that address this issue and also incentivize people to engage in such programs um, and our trainings, uh, skills building, seminars, things like that? Um, and what feasible incentives are there? Um, should we just jump in as, okay. Uh, so I, I can point to something that I think is a really interesting development in Colorado. They have an office of just transition, um, which is specifically has been specifically created to address the issue, the challenges of jobs of workers transitioning out of the fossil fuel sector jobs and into new jobs. Um, you know, in our report, like I was saying in my presentation, we try to develop sort of a framework for. Uh, uh, just transition out of these jobs um, by saying, well, you know, let's think about the supports that workers will need 
as these fossil sector fuel sector jobs go away, um, because there is going to be public spending involved in a lot of projects, there are things that the government can use as levers. You know, for example, a job guarantee. If there are certain jobs that become that are available through the investments that are being made with public monies, those can be workers who are leaving the fossil fuel sectors can be prioritized in filling those jobs. Um, and then there are also just policies in terms of wage insurance to make sure that the transition from one job to the other doesn't create a huge um, gap in the income that workers are, are earning, um, job training, uh, figuring out what are the actual job training needs of workers and matching them up to, say, uh, union company uh, partnerships that have apprenticeships, that sort of thing. I mean, so I, I was just looking at the, the website for this, the Office of um, just transition in Colorado, just because uh, I was curious about how much has been implemented. And unfortunately, it seems like they're quite at the early stages, but it's promising that there is a dedicated agency to guide this. And I think that's what's really hopeful to me is that there is policies are really mindful. Like we can't, we, we are anticipating this shift in the economy. So what are the things that we need to put in place in order to make this shift less painful, more um, uh, helpful to workers. Uh, and so it seems that Colorado is making th this important first step, which is to actually create an agency to guide this process. Um, and, you know, we have the, we know what's happening. So we, we, we know we need to do it. Thank you for your answer. Maybe um, since we're running out of time and I really want Eloisa to also join the Q&A, um, I'll encourage also the speakers to take a look of the, at the Q&A chat. There are some good comments there, but I'm actually going to ask a question that has been previously asked when you registered for the event today. This question is from Yilin, a computing mathematics major studying in Hong Kong. And her question is really interesting because uh, she wants to understand more of what type of role should the government play for a just energy transition? And if there's any possibility of connecting with universities. And I'll maybe pass over to Eloisa for this question, um, especially because Jeanette, you showed some really interesting data of the costs of the transition. And so I think this is a question we all have. What can the <laughs> government do? Thank you, Eduarda. Well, the government can do a lot, should do a lot. Uh, Jeanette pointed out an example of a specific agency. Uh, but for instance, regarding education, uh, we could, uh, and uh, uh, especially in Brazil, uh, we are uh, trying also to always to, to, to use uh, incentives and public oriented uh, 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 funds instead of governmental funds. Uh, so um, you asked about the the, the uh, university specifically. Uh, we have um, uh, training programs, uh, or public oriented funding for specific programs for energy industries, both uh, all energy industries. In Portuguese, it's uh, PH, uh, uh, human resources programs. That have and they 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 range from law, engineering, economics. Uh, it's it's very useful uh, when addressing like you identify the needs and then you go to the universities and try to 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 build programs for specific qualification uh, for those needs. But that's higher education, <laughs> right? So we also need to think about the technical capabilities not every not every job requires a, 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 a university degree so uh, in, we should address universities higher education but also use them and we did that in brazil for technical programs um, for you know operators or or if we think wind norway has a very good training facility public funded specifically for wind and offshore wind uh, capabilities. So they, they, re, um, they retrain the workforce, usually uh, uh, 
previously from oil and gas, and they are training them to work in the wind and offshore wind uh, uh, industry. So that's very interesting as well. That specific uh, program is based, that specific training uh, um, facility, it's, it's based in a university in Stavanger, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I, I might be. Uh, I, uh, I, I think it's Tavanga, but I would have to double check my, my, my number, my, my, my information. So uh, I think the role of the government is like you have this information and this broad view. Uh, you have to identify the needs and then search, reach, the, reach out to the universities and try to build and programs that would address that future needs. Uh, uh, because there's a gap. Eventually, the, the educational system would identify, but then uh, probably you would have a gap. Uh, uh, and if the government acts before, uh, uh, you can prevent or, or minimize uh, that gap locally. Uh, I don't know if I fully, under, fully answered your question, but I, I, I could... I could in, I could take uh, examples from many countries. Uh, most countries in Latin America have uh, programs uh, such as I, I gave the example from Brazil, for instance. Uh, in most, uh, uh, in Norway, they have lots of uh, uh, programs that are structured like that, like the government identifies the need. And then there's a public oriented uh, spending towards uh, to address that specific uh, uh, issue. No, you did. I think you did answer the question, Eloisa. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll go back to another one that was uh, submitted beforehand by the students. Um, this one is from Christina, a major, a law major studying in Brazil. She is asking about young people. So you know now to how can young people qualify to uh, enter this new job market with green jobs being created? Or do you, and this question for both of you, do you think that these uh, new careers will also attract uh, people from other lines of work outside the energy sector? Definitely. Uh, I think uh, the, the good thing about being young is that you have time to make mistakes or to change course. Uh, you always can change course, but it, it, it gets harder uh, over time. Uh, I think what young people should do, it's not look at the specific uh, 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 career, but build the competences, competences that you will need for, you know, for this uh, future that has multiple possibilities. Uh, since you're young, I assume you have Disney Plus and you've seen the Loki uh, a series. It's just an assumption because I did and I think it's great. It works with the idea of multiple futures, a multiverse of futures. So different paths and each decision you take, it's a nice thing concept that, you know, Disney uh, appropriated, but they showed it re really well. Each path you take, each decision it leads to a different future and it's very hard to predict that future. So think of the competences uh, and think of the, the competence that will allow you to work in this energy future that might, be, you don't know, you might, it might be CCUS, it might be hydrogen, might be synthetic fuels, it might be uh, renewable. So if you choose now, uh, you probably, of course, you, you can reach that specific industry job and path that you're aiming for. But it, it, for younger people, I think it's useful to build uh, on skills that will help you transit into that. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 technical skills are always good. So, uh, um, math, engineering, uh, the ability to work with data, but, uh, and you, you, you're a law student, so the ability to understand uh, uh, 
that the different contracts, for instance, the, the, the way the law is structured, the contracts will change because they will need to address issues that current model contracts do not address. Uh, how do you open yourself to that? How do you try and understand uh, 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 the problem instead of just focusing on the, 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 the wording of the contract, for instance, that's a very important ability for a lawyer. Understand your client and not the, uh, 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 not the law itself. I just thought I'd jump in because one of the things that we try to stress in the studies we've done is the, the full range of jobs that are being produced by these clean energy investments. Because what we try to break out is really, you know, what kind of occupations are gaining jobs? And they really, they range uh, in terms of both the kinds of qualifications that are necessary for the jobs um, and it's just the types of work. So, you know, accountants, lawyers, engineers, construction laborers, um, transit workers, these are all jobs that are being created, that will be created by these clean energy investments. It's not in one specific area. I, you can think of them as, you know, it's just broadening the number of opportunities across the board in the economy because the investments are so large, but also because there are a lot of different activities that require uh, that these investments require support, you know, through just moving things from place to place keeping things orderly and having the technology to organize the workers, human resource managers, you know, technicians and electricity. And it just all, there's a very wide range of jobs that are being, that will be created by these investments. And then I just want to, the other thing I just wanted to add was uh, a role that the government can take that I think is really important. Um, again, addressing this issue about the gender gap and also the, at least in the US, the you know, racial composition of the types of jobs that'll be created. An important lever that the U.S. government has taken in the past and um, and with some good effect is affirmative action policies tied to public monies. So that if there are contracts that involve public money, that they can pursue, they can have the contractors commit to a certain level of diversity within the workforce and then be subject to enforcement by uh, federal agencies to see, you know, are they making good faith efforts? Uh, what does the composition of the workforce look like compared to what's available? And that has had some positive impact in making sure that the workforce that's being hired by these jobs, these contracts with public monies, is actually diverse. There, thank, thank you both for your answer. Sorry, I think there's a glitch with my computer, but, um, and I think those are great answers. And I think the next one I'm going to ask is um, even more challenging to answer. Um, so Yanni is a law and sustainable development major studying in Greece is asking, what can the energy job sector do to ensure a bloodless transition or, you know, making sure that people, the most vulnerable communities will suffer the least. And I think it was you, Eloisa, that you showed that a lot of the jobs um, that are being lost are actually not necessarily in the same geographical uh, location. So in some countries that could mean um, regions that have more low income populations or even the most dependent communities on fossil fuels are generally also from a mo more low lower income background. So what do you both uh, have to say about this and how can we make it more painless for the people that are in a more vulnerable state? Should I start? Okay. Uh, again, uh, good policy design. We have to understand that uh, uh, you try to requalify, but some of the communities, uh, uh, you need other forms of uh, public programs. Uh, the first step, to ensuring a bloodless transition is identify which communities will lose more uh, so that you can uh, uh, prepare in advance. It's the first step. Uh, 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 you, have to, you have to map it. We, we have to map it. Uh, and the energy industry, because specifically you asked about what the energy sector can do. I think the first step is to help with this identification, because most companies, they, they, 
they have the means and the information to, you know, uh, 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 to go locally and, and, and work with government. So I think the, the first step for the energy industry is to share that information and try to build together that mapping. Uh, then uh, I think the, the second step it's for the governments, right? So, uh, we ha you have to design policies that will allow for this to be bloodless. Uh, and I think the, the, the important part uh, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of the equation is again, uh, you have to do ESG, but you know, not uh, uh, in practice, not in theory. Uh, most uh, ESG programs, they are very, very beautiful PowerPoints. Uh, but in practice, we are not there yet. So uh, uh, when you go to the communities, uh, uh, um, again, uh, uh, prob probably the energy sector would have to be, able to be willing uh, uh, to collaborate with the governments in actual, uh, 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 you know, actual actions. I don't know if that exists in English, but actual uh, uh, measures uh, uh, to ensure that transition, understanding that part, again, part of those jobs, they're not going to be relocated because it will be somewhere else. It will be other people. So when you look and, and think of the people what what we do what do we do to guarantee us i think janet showed up locally okay part of this part of this will go to retirement and part will actually need a uh, 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 public policy and public funds in order to help them uh, 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 help them out so yeah, i think we learned you know from the 80s and the 90s and all the the industry industrial transformation that most countries uh, uh went and you know how entire communities were left behind i i'm a hopeful person i'm a, i'm not i'm a natural born optimistic so we learned and and i think we can do better this time yeah, one thing I, I want to add to this conversation is that one of the things that we've tried to do uh, with our studies is to engage the labor union um, groups that are, you know, that represent the workers in the fossil fuel sectors, for example, to have conversations with those, uh, with the um, union members to talk about what are the challenges that these workers anticipate. And again, it's, I think it goes back to what Eloisa was saying was that we know this change is happening we can anticipate these this contraction, this shift. So let's let's be mindful about what are the policies we need to make. And one of the things that's really important is to engage the workers who are going to be displaced and saying, what are the needs of these workers? What do they think they are in a need to transition? And to get them on board with this project. You know, what how do we make this a bloodless transition? Tell us, you know, that's a really important part of the conversation. I, I really appreciate that response. And I think that one of the things I always, you know, try to bring in these uh, in these discussions is like a bottom up approach, because at the end of the day, there's a big disconnect between what policymakers are trying to do and what communities really need. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I'll maybe ask uh, one final question. Um, so another one that we received here for PONS, a sustainable development major study in New York City. Uh, he'd like to hear more in-depth reasoning as to what emissions reduction strategies, interventions, and initiatives uh, you both believe will sufficiently support job quality and access in the emerging low-carbon regional economy uh, within a legal framework. So maybe I'm trying to rephrase it in a more direct um, way here, but in terms of job quality, maybe even uh, the next step once you receive, when once you're entering this industry, how do you ensure that there will be quality and access and an actual mitigation of your emissions? Uh, 
how do you ensure that? Well, you measure and you enforce uh, 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 the, the mandates you, you chose to, to follow. That's, uh, that's how you, that's how you should. But again, uh, I think the, the, the first step is to commit to actual policies. Um, and for those policies to be credible, for those decarbonization policies to be credible, uh, they have to take advantages of what you already have. Uh, for instance, a country, just an example, a country that does not have uh, nuclear technology, does not already have that, should it really go through that path, small nuclear reactors and try to go to the... Can you choose uh, uh, another capability, another uh, 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 technology that you already have, you already have the value chain in your country? Can you choose a strategy? Because uh, what we what we see uh, when we analyze global policies is that sometimes uh, you choose pathways that are not credible from the start, uh, and then you make promises that have a very high probability of not being fulfilled. Uh, and that uh, 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 creates, uh, 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 that always backfires. So uh, what I would, uh, uh, what we always recommend is, okay, try to, to design a credible policy and then, measure it. It's true for any public policy, education, labor, economic, uh, uh, energy. So uh, I think the, the only way to ensure that you're getting there is to measure and enforce. I think my response is also somewhat general, um, because I think that you know, the thing that will ensure good quality jobs being produced by this transition is kind of a, a, applies across the board uh, in terms of jobs. You know, what what are the specific government level levers, the policies that we know have helped improve the quality of jobs that are being created? Those are things like certain labor standards. Um, you know, one of the things that became very um, a very active area of organizing in the U.S. during the early 2000s was the living wage movement, was the idea that if there's any public money going to employment, uh, contracts, subsidizing um, developments, anything like that, that there was a labor standard that would be put in place, that a living wage standard had to be met by those contractors or those who were getting public subsidies. So that's the same kind of thing with um, any investments that go into the clean energy um, clean energy sectors is, is the idea that, you know, it's not um, specific, I don't think, to those jobs, but the idea that the government in particular has a lever of saying, if we're going to support these investments in some way, that we can put some standards to them. And we have experience, at least in the U.S., of doing that and having some success with it. And so that would you know, apply to any of the investments that would be generated to get to a clean energy economy that is being supported by public dollars. I know this was a very challenging one. So thank you so much for, for the responses that you gave. And with that, I think this was our final question because of time. So I wanted to really thank you both, Louise and Jeanette, for your contributions. I'm sure the students learned a lot. And maybe Gail, if you wanna um, give some final words. Yes, thank you so much. I think there's so many, I loved, especially Eloisa, how you talked about um, you know students focusing on general skills and general um, you know, like their their competencies. And in the same way, like what you just shared, Jeanette, it's like when we look at just transition, when we look at just ac actions, it really is sort of, it can be applied anywhere, right? That, that we need to be thinking in those terms about so many aspects. So thank you both so much for that. Thank you um, also to Eduarda for moderating. And we're just really grateful for um, to the Sustainable uh, Development Solutions Network, as well as the Columbia Global Centers in Rio for their partnership to produce these global seminars for our students and for the, for the public. Um, I think it's really uh, just a great service. Um, 
And most of all, we appreciate everyone who's joined us today, including our collaboratory students. Please mark your calendars to attend the third global seminar in our Pathways to Decarbonization series. It is on Wednesday, October 19th, again at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We look forward to seeing you there. And again, just thank you to everyone for participating and joining us today.